We are going to talk about Gray software, which is also known as Queen of Software. So, she was the first person to program a computer. So, back in 1951, she was working on Mark 1 computer. So, it was then she programmed the first computer. So, she is also the inventor of Cobalt programming language. So, how many of you have heard about it? Yeah. How many have used? <laughs> Neither of them. <coughs> so, uh, she also popularized the idea of machine independent languages. So, ah, this was your friends. How many of you have actually heard about it? Okay, so, how many of very few? How many female students have not heard about about her? Not heard. Okay, so Google has this regular meeting called Grace Hopper, uh, some <coughs> technological meeting, something like that, and that's where it in like. It invites all the women in, in STEM. So it's a good opportunity to go. So it's trying to popularize and it's been christened under uh, her name, Grace Hopper. So there is an annual event in India and there are certain events, a few events which happen uh, outside India also. Next. So does anyone know the story behind the word debugging? Yes. Yeah. 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 So it is Grace Murray Hopper, the grandmother of computer programming, was born on December 9, 1906. She attended Vassar College, graduating in 1928 with a degree in math and physics. After graduating, she accepted a position as an assistant professor at Vassar, which would help her pay her way through Yale, where she received both a master's and a PhD in mathematics. Satisfied with three math degrees under her belt, Hopper went back to Vassar, now as a full-time professor. She spent the next 10 years molding young minds. And then World War II broke out. Hopper wanted to do her part in the war effort, so she applied for the WAVES program, which stood for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. It was basically the first program that expanded women's wartime roles beyond nursing and administrative duties. And in 1943, she was accepted to WAVES and joined the U.S. Naval Reserve. She was then assigned to work on the Mark series of computers at Harvard. The Mark I was one of the first electromechanical computers used in war efforts, and the first of its kind produced in the United States. While working on the Mark II, Hopper discovered an unusual glitch. One day, the computer inexplicably shorted out due to a moth stuck in the hardware. The bug was removed, and Hopper referred to this solution as debugging the computer. Finally, in 1952, she revolutionized computer programming as we know it. She and her team invented the first compiler, a program that converted common sense commands into binary computer language. This blew the doors off computer programming. Every subsequent programming language is built on her work. And it's no exaggeration to say that we owe computer programming as we know it to Hopper. At 60, Hopper retired from the Navy with more than two decades of naval service under her belt. But her retirement didn't last long. Less than a year later, Uncle Sam came calling again asking her to come back to standardize COBOL for the Navy. Always the dutiful patriot, Hopper returned to active service for another 20 years. Grace Hopper died on January 1st, 1992. In her later life, when asked what her greatest accomplishment was, Hopper was known to respond, all of the young people I've trained. So, this is about Grace Hopper. So, if she hadn't been there, I think it will be a little late for us to discuss all this compiler stuff and everything. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now quickly do 60 things. minutes. Rewind. Captain Hopper is a whiz at mathematics. Some would say. Sorry about that. So we'll quickly revise what we did in the previous lecture. Any doubts uh, people have? In case not, I'm going to ask some of you to tell the answers. So we start off with virtual address space, a physical address space, and we're going to look into the operation of TLBs. So we divided the physical address space into different page chunks. One of the page uh, corresponds to the linear page table, which contains the entries. Entries corresponding to the relationship between virtual page numbers and physical page numbers, physical frame numbers. So in this case, we have VPN equal to 1 corresponds to VPN equal to 4. And the array is stored from 39 to 42 in the virtual address and from 7 to 10 in the physical address. 
Okay, so Monarch, what happens now? Okay, so VPN is VPN is one. Okay, good. No, we have TLB. We have a translation look at box. No, no, no. So physical address, we don't get to the physical address at this point. So we have a entity called TLB and we have the physical memory. Sorry. What is PFA? PFN or PFA? How do we find that? So if we directly go to the linear page table, then what's the use of TLB? In the TLB. Yeah. So then why are you directly going to the page table? So we'll firstly go to the TLB. Okay, then? Uh, then we'll find out the PFN. But the PFN does not exist. Yeah, so we'll put it in the TLB. So how do we put it in the TLB? What's the entire? Yeah, okay, so if you don't find an entry in the uh, TLB, then it's called a Yes. It's called a mess. You look in the TLP for VP equal to 1, it's a mess. If, it's, if there's a TLP mess, then what happens? Okay, we go to the physical address, but we first go to the page table. So we go to the page table for VP equal to 1, we try to find the mapping. We found that, that we found that 1 is mapped to 4. We put this entry into the TLB, and now? Okay, Naman, what happens after this? We then again go to TLB, right? TLB get it. Yeah, so we get a TLB hit. We search for the translation, we get a TLB hit. Okay. Then we change the number. We get a TLB hit. But we have not got the physical address. We have got the frame number from the TLP. Okay, we go to the frame number and then? We do the operation. What operation? Move operation. No, so the move operation will happen on a physical address, not on the physical frame number. So how do you get the physical address corresponding to one of the So you've got from VPN 1 to VPN 4 is the mapping you've got thus far. But we want the exact physical address for 102. Okay, good. So we calculate the offset in this. In this particular case, the offset is it starts at 1k and this is 1024. 0. So 1k, so here at 1k means 1024, let's say. So the offset is 0. So 1024 here will map to p equal to 4 is the starting address of it. Good. So we get the physical address of this then. So then we fetch the instruction. Uh, okay, what happens now? So like we have fetched the instruction, we have executed it. So we implement the program counter. Uh, to execute this, we still need to do something. So, so okay, so there there is a register uh, zero x. So 0x is on the register, it's a value. So everything starting with oh, ampersand, oh, sorry, yeah. The dollar so in is the not. TDI, in the EDI, there is a uh, location of the array, mm -hmm. the first uh, address. Yeah. Yeah. So in the base address. So that base address corresponds to, I think, 40,000. 40,000, yeah. So uh, we calculate the VPN for that. So before that, we do EDI plus 4 into EAX because uh, I corresponds to EAX. So, so currently, like i is equal to like yeah. yeah. So first, if i i to zero, then so we calculate the VPN for that. that uh, you get the so before calculating the VPN, you get the VA, which is forty thousand. Yeah, forty thousand. So after you get the VA, then you get the VPN. Okay, so you read the instruction, you find out PDI plus forty into VX, which is VA equal to forty thousand. That's got that corresponds to VPN equal to. So then, what do you do? Then we check in the TLP. 
Okay, so but like, <coughs> you don't find the you can find names. So it's a, a LMS. Then we go to the linear page table. Okay. And to look up the we uh, the PFN for the the thirty nine weekend. Right. And we get the PFN is equal to seven. Right. So uh, and the offset we calculate is zero because like it's the first element in the right. page. So right. we take the uh, like the first element in the PFN. Right. Equal to seven. Good. Okay. And Monica, what happened after this? Little louder, please. Okay, ask me. So, if there's a glad instruction, we execute, uh, so the attack address, we execute the instruction, and then the program counter updates. The program counter updates to 102 and after this. After this, we are going for the same procedure. Like yeah, what's the procedure? We will look for the uh, <coughs> in the TLV. We will look for the VPN one uh, mapping. So one zero two eight VA corresponds to VPN equal to one. one. VPN equal to one. We look in the TLV. Yeah, and this is the number four. So we will go at offset eight. So offset four. Uh, yeah, offset four offset and four. VPN four. Yes. And then we will so it's a TLV hit. So we don't need to access the memory. The memory as in we don't need to access the page table again. So it's a single memory access compared to two memory accesses. Good. So we get PFN equal to four plus the offset executed. Okay. So why does paging work as a concept? It's because of spatial and temporal locality. Uh, okay. So what is spatial locality? So a program is used. If, if some number is used, and then it's very highly likely that number in the neighbors are going to be used, like in any case of that. So what's so what do you mean by number? Number like virtual address. Virtual, address. Like a virtual address is being used. It's very likely that similar virtual addresses will be used. So one is the code segment. So we saw that adjacent code segment, uh, sorry, additional codes uh, addresses will be used, and then also the array. But that's the spatial locality. Demonic, what's the uh, temporal locality? Temporal locality is the same instance in the same data level. We are using, like, what, now that we are using, I'm very sure that I'll maybe use again in a little while again. Right. So example is a loop. Yeah, good. So, we saw this simple example of calculating <coughs> the cycle, right? So, if it takes one clock cycle, mix takes 30 clock cycles, what's the uh, cycle rate? It's the probability of a hit, which is 99%, 0 0.99 into 1, plus the probability of a miss. 30 uh, cycles for a miss, plus a cycle for the hit. So it's total 120 cycles. Okay, so we started the discussion about a context which we said that let's say there are two different processes. Process 1 was executing at this point of time, but then all the processes are very short kept. Let's say there is some kind of round robin scheduling. P2 comes and executes, it has its own virtual address space. Let's say it also has a virtual page number one, but it corresponds to a different page frame number. Now, if you use the TLV as it is, it's problematic because a single entry in the VPN corresponds to multiple in the PFN. So, TLV in fact has more bits to it. Uh, than just the VPN and the corresponding PFN. It has a valid bit, whether valid, valid translation exists or not. It has a permission bit, and it has an address space ID. So at this point of time, I've not been able to figure out the exact differences between ASID and PID. I, I know for sure that ASID is 8 bits, whereas uh, PID can be 32 bits. So that's all I know for now. But if I find out something, or if you find out something, that, uh, let, the, let each other know. So now what happens is these two have different address space IDs. So in that case, how do you think the execution will work? If process one is switched to P2, how will the TLB, uh, how will you maintain the state of the TLB? Or if process two now wants to execute, uh, find out the physical address corresponding to VPN equal to one, what happens? So one is one method is to check the ASID. Other things which you could do technically is to 
you so mark the valid bits as invalid for the other processes. You could do that, you could just use the ASID. All of this is again some additional over it, but then you get the benefit of true space multiplexing rather than time multiplexing. Uh, yeah. So, what is the ASID? Address space. In case of a cash miss, are we allowed to uh, remove the PLB of other programs? Uh, in case of a cash miss, can we remove that? I don't know. I think. No. I don't know. So it should always be possible, but then I think again it's a question of policies, whether you, whether a particular policy will do or not, and and also, even if the policy might allow, it's also then a question of mechanism, like can you potentially do that or not, even though the policy might allow. So, sorry, you were saying something? Yes, sir. I was saying that maybe it's a cash miss because the TLD is very enough with the VPNs of the different process. Right. So, so yeah, so this is, there could be different policies as in each process does not get more than four <coughs> entries or eight entries. You can have those kind of policies or you can have some policies that, you know, I don't care about the processes being used. All I care about is what is the most recent process being used. So I want to just optimize that. Then there are some other tricks or other things which happen under the old. So all processes generally don't have the same uh, priority. So one one example we saw was MLFQ. The other is there's, so there is a utility called nice. So there is niceness associated with each process ID. That's something again we can consider. But I don't think there's a very definite answer that I know of. <coughs> okay, so TLB entry replacement. So as uh, Heer was already pointing out, so we might have cache misses. We want to we might want to replace some entries in the TLB. The TLB has to be a small uh, entity. So it's not a huge entity. Otherwise, it will defeat the purpose. So, why do we want to replace the TLB entries? Because it's small, and because it's small, so there is only a limited amount of uh, storage we can have there. When do we want to replace the entries in the TLB? So, one you already pointed out that a different process now wants to is having cache misses or TLB misses. So, you want to somehow replace existing entries so that you can still uh, you can give more entries to the current process or if newer translations are found. So whenever there is a miss, you want to add that entry. Of course, there is some element of heuristic or some element of fine tuning you can always do. So you know, maybe you say that only if there is, only if a miss occurs X number of times do I replace an entry. Why would you do something like this? Because of locality. So let's say that there are certain number of addresses that <coughs> You very sure that they'll be accessed again and again, but then there's some address which just pops out of random, just pops out randomly. So you don't want to, uh, you don't want to replace that particular set of pages in order to just accommodate a new translation, which might maybe very, uh, very, very sparsely used. Whenever you have a context which you can do some kind of replacement, or you have to do some kind of. Uh, Changes to the TLB, as in the valid bits, you can change or the address space, uh, ASID, you can add or remove. And how do we replace the TLB entries? So this is based on what you would have already uh, studied in architecture. So what kind of policies do you think we can use for replacement? The least recently used. These recently used. Mm -hmm. Why would you use these recently used? Because so something, yeah, temporary locality, uh, locality because something which is not being used for some time, you should just maybe evict that page. You could remove at random also, which typically works reasonably well. Could you tell any shortcoming of LRU? Most case. Sorry? We're finding the least. Okay, so yeah, finding. So you'll have to again. So maintain some. Bits so you have to maintain some timer, <coughs> and you'll have to uh, for each clock cycle, you'll have to maintain some kind of uh, another data structure which tells that how many time minutes have passed. Uh, other other shortcomings. So where this policy will fail. So that's what I'm trying to come to. 
we would lrg make no sense at all so yeah so somewhat somewhat on the right track so let's say that we have this particular corner case where the tlp size is n n means that you can have n transitions and we're trying to do n plus 1 page accesses in a loop so each time you want to the, the least recent p1 would be removed but then that's the one you want to access next so in such cases random would perform much better than lrg sir so, uh, any problem Can you explain a newer translation form to into this? Sorry, newer translation. Form. Oh, so newer translation means that so let's say that the TLB is full, mm -hmm. and another new translation has been found. So there was a TLB miss. Okay. So then you have to add. So whenever there is a TLB miss, you add an entry. Now if the space is full. You have to evict out some of the entries. Okay. So this is a very important slide to to understand the whole crux of memory virtualization. So what approach did we first start with? Base, base and bounds. We started with base and bounds. The pros were that it's fairly quick. It requires only two resistors. What were the cons? Fragmentation. And fragmentation occurs <coughs> because we require a contiguous block of memory. So, so we focus on the shortcomings of base and bounds. We wanted to improve upon that. So we, we looked at contiguous block of memory. How can we break this up? What was the next approach? Segmentation. The pros are so comparatively less fragmentation uh, with respect to base and bounds, and in terms of speed, slow. It's still reasonably quick because it's, you don't require a lot of uh, hardware and a lot of calculations for this. Three registers are required. Lesser fragmentation. In terms of cons. So still there is some amount of internal fragmentation because you can have big contiguous so each of the segments still requires big contiguous chunks for each segment. So then we moved on to so before we moved to paging we discussed another thought experiment that was so we go to the extreme that we have a single so we have a one byte to a byte mapping. Why is that bad? So there is a huge amount of overhead in in memory, but in time, assume it's a hash map. Quick. It's, it's order of one, right? Very quick. So whenever we're looking at these <coughs> different uh, approaches, so we're looking at different uh, design space. So we started with contiguous block of memory, which makes it less practical and leads to fragmentation. We have relatively solved the fragmentation problem with paging. <coughs> paging is it's, because it's if the page size is relatively small, the chances of fragmentation are uh, fairly low. But then the cons are, so one is slow, why is, uh, why is paging slow compared to say segmentation of base and bounds? Deepak, why is uh, paging slow? Right, so assume that TLP doesn't exist. We first go to the page table, that is one axis. From the page table, we find out the corresponding entry in the uh, in the physical address space. So two uh, memory accesses are required, which makes it slow. The other is a lot of, uh, there, there is a huge amount of memory overhead. So per process, we discussed that, you know, something for a team of 4 MB would be required. 100 process 400 MB, so it doesn't make sense. So, so now let's we then looked at. So once we discussed paging, we wanted to improve some aspect of it. We used paging plus TLB, which improved which which of the cons? Speed. Speed. The speed, right? The slowness. So what cons still left? Memory, Memory overhead, and that's what we we'll now look at. So just try and maintain the big picture that we started with the big problem that you know virtualization, why do we need virtualization? We started with fairly trivial naive approaches. Each of them had their flaws which we start to overcome. Now each time we overcome a flaw, there's an additional level of complexity. And each time you overcome a flaw, there's you know you have there's more cost. For example, from paging to paging plus TLB, 
there is an additional cost of the hardware which you have to put TLB. Uh, <coughs> going from base and bounce segmentation, there is an additional cost of additional register you require. And going from, so if you want to reduce the memory, what do you think we'll have to compensate for? No, so, so let's discuss about generally when we discuss algorithms. There's memory, what is the other aspect? Time. So if we want to reduce the memory, we'll probably have to increase the time. So just try and maintain this big picture. Paging plus TLB improves your average translation speed. That's because of the spatial and temporal locality. Cache makes sense. The cons is that it's fairly limited in size, the TLB. The memory over it, so have we done anything with the memory over it thus far? No, right? So still the per process memory over it would be uh, the same. In fact, slightly more given the fact that the TLB will also have some over it in terms of the memory. Not huge, but some. So let's try and now reduce the more memory overhead of paging. So we have thus far settled on the fact that you know paging is the approach that we look at and we want to improve it. So let's start with 32-bit addresses with 4K pages. 4K, 4KB would corresponding to would correspond to 12 bits. So if we have 12 bits here, how many bits for the VPN? 20, 20 bits for the VPN. Number of pages to rest part 20. So we keep on repeating this slide, but uh, this is useful to look at the different operations we can do or different optimizations we can do. So this was 4 bytes per translation, about 4 MB per process. Let's try and reduce this 4 MB per process. So any thoughts on how we can reduce this? I think Devon, you already said something. So if we have to reduce the number of pages, we have to we have to increase the page size. So if you if you see the simple formula, you have the page size, uh, that is the offset, plus the number of pages, that is the VPN. So both of them should sum, the number of bits required should sum to 32. So if you increase one of them, the other one would be naturally decreased. But before that, let's look at something even more trivial. So let's say that I want to decrease <coughs> the size of the virtual address space. Then what happens? So I'm currently using 32 bits. How many bits? Let's say, if you were to give, a, uh, if you were to give an example, 32 to say we move to. So let's say we have 12 bit offset, 4K pages. From 32, let's say we move to 30 bit address space. What's the disadvantage of uh, moving to this? Less space for the process. process. Less memory. Less memory. Yeah. So 32 bits can address how much memory? To four gigs. To the power, 30 bits can address? Two, one, one GB. So this, the advantage is that now we have 18 bit VPN, assuming that the offset remains the same. Earlier we had 20 bit VPN. <coughs> so 4 byte for translation would amount to 1 MB per process. So if the goal is only to reduce the overhead of paging, you could very well do this. But then this comes at an additional cost or there is a trade-off. The trade-off being that now you reduce the address space from 4 GB to 1 GB. So the maximum amount of addressable memory is reduced. Why is this bad? Because now you cannot actually address anything more than 1 GB. Any process can't get more than that. The second solution is what we've been discussing thus far. So increase the page size. If we start with 32 bit address space, 16 KB pages. Earlier we were using 4 KB pages. So it's a four fold increase in the page size. So the number of bits additional required is the number of bits which is remaining for the VPN is 32 minus 12 plus 2, so it's 18. So now what's the size per process? Memory over it? 4 MB divided by 4. So that's 1 MB per process. Everyone with me thus far? What's the disadvantage of this approach? So now we've increased the base size. If we increase the base size, then what happens? So we can have internal fragmentation. So again, each solution will come with some set of trade-offs, and that's what we need to understand. So what point in the design space do we finally pick up? Now let's look at some of the ways of 
reducing the overheads. So let's say we had this kind of a mapping, virtual address to physical address space, and let's say we have three different code segments. The red corresponds to the page that have, which are valid basically, which have a valid translation, corresponds <coughs> to the physical address space, which is much more than VA in this case. So one thing to note is that all of these, all of this space is wasted. So let's say, so for, for per process, we allocate the same amount of uh, virtual address space. There is a process which requires, let's say, absolutely no heap, very small amount of code, very small amount of stack. All of this space gets wasted. So let's say if it was 4 MB, so maybe 3 MB is just wasted. We have to unnecessarily create this data structure. So this was in a linear page table. So linear page table would maybe look something like the following in the previous case. Uh, PFN, so this is basically 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on the virtual address space. 0 corresponds to PFN 10, and it's a valid translation. The other translations which do not have correct, like, are invalid because they don't have a mapping correct. We keep them to 0, and then we have 1 in the heap, and a couple of translations exist in the stack. So here again, we look at in the linear page table that the amount of uh, Space is still huge. So, uh, the, in the previous slide, the pages which are not mapped to the physical address, mm -hmm. so they, uh, these don't have any mapping. Right? They don't have any mapping. So, uh, and uh, we are concerned about the physical address, uh, physical memory. Right. So they are not uh, violating any physical memory, using any physical memory. So, the page table is using the memory. So the overhead now we're trying to reduce is of the page. <coughs> So, so these are mapped to some uh, pages. So, so these are the pages in the virtual address space, pages in the physical address space. Physical address space is going to be sparsely populated, that we all understand. But the virtual address space is also very sparsely populated, which means that there are very few pages which exist in the 16, let's say 16, out of these 16 pages, only 5 are currently valid. So the remaining 11 are invalid. So all of this 11, all of these 16 pages are also stored somewhere in the memory. Okay. So all these 11s are mapped to some physical uh, frame, page frame number? So, so this entire page table, let's say belongs to this entire physical, uh, so this entire virtual address space is is existing somewhere in the physical address space. So you're wasting, let's say, 3 MB out of the 4 MB in this chunk. Okay. Everyone with me at this point of time? So this is the memory overhead we're trying to reduce. We're not reducing the memory over it on the physical address space. Like technically we are reducing it on the physical address space, but we're trying to reduce the over it off the page table. Everyone with me? So let's look at the linear page table for uh, for this case. Sir, just one more yeah. thing. Uh, if it is linear page table, then we are uh, wasting that space. Right? Yeah. If it is not, then we are not wasting that. Yeah, so that's what we are going to do. So instead of linear, what better can we do? Okay, so this is the linear page table. This space is wasted. We somehow want to make good use of the main memory, physical memory. So linear page table. Okay, so lookup is order one. Why is it order one and not linear? Sorry, why is it not O of n? Yeah. So there is a direct mapping because we know that corresponding to each VA was the corresponding PFN. And because all of them are in order. But let's say there was no order in them, then again it would have been O of n. That's something which we don't want, but fortunately for us, it's O of n. The space is 16 into the uh, size of each entry. So there are 16 entries for this particular example. Everyone with me? So let's say we convert this into, so what sparse data structures have we seen thus far in our algorithms, data structures course? Linked list, any other ideas? Hash table, okay. So would linked list make sense then? No? Why not? Yeah, why not? The time, the time, the order, and yeah. So, 
So whenever we discuss any approach, it will come with its own set of trade-offs. There will be some positives, some negatives. So let's say we do convert into a linked list just to see how the performance will change. So the linked list would say look something like this, something like this. VPN 0 maps to VPN 10. 0, 10. The next element is VPN 4 maps to 23, so on and so forth. Simple structure, again. So the lookup will be O of order n, where n corresponds to the number of valid pages. What's the space requirements, memory requirements? So the number of valid into the size of each uh, entry, page table entry. So previously this was 16 into size, this time it's n into size. And since n is really small here, it's 4, because of sparse address space. So if memory is our only constraint, linked list does make sense. But it has an additional time over it. Okay, so when we were starting, when we started this whole discussion of uh, segmentation, sorry, fragmentation, what solutions were we picking up? What solutions did we start with? So pace and bounds introduced the notion of fragmentation. We improved it using so segmentation improved uh, fragmentation. What other approaches did we use? Paging. Paging and segmentation improved the fragmentation in the physical address space. Right? Now we want to um, reduce the fragmentation in the virtual address space because all of this is getting wasted. Everyone with me? So we reduce segmentation, we use paging. So now the idea is can we use segmentation here on the, not, not exactly here. So on the on the linear page table, instead of having it completely filled, can we create a different page table for each segment? That's the crux uh, of the side. So we use a different page table for each heap, stack, and the code. Now, why do we think it's a good idea to do that? The same reason why we did segmentation for the paper. So exact same reason. So Previously, when we use segmentation, we said that the problem was we have to give an entire contiguous block of memory. We have to allocate memory for that, and we have to. So, there's a direct correspondence between the VA and the BA. It's just that it's dynamically relocated to a different location. And whenever there is internal wastage, we can't do anything about it. So, then we move to segmentation, for, for which we said that for each code segment, there's a lot of gap in between them, but let's store only the <coughs> start virtual address corresponding to each segment and the bounds for it. So we'll do something similar, use a different page table for each code segment. Each of the page tables now can also have a different size because you have different code segments, each of them have different size, so the page table can also have a different size. And each of them will now have a base and bounds as we had in previously in segmentation. So base and bounds register was stored in where were the base and bounds registers from? Yeah, you. Sorry. Where in memory? Yeah. RAM. Okay. Any other? So base and bounds are registers. Where we store them? Right, right. Anyone remembers uh, ALU? So they're not stored in ALU. But that's an end. ALU stands for? Okay. So what's the last <coughs> unit? So the answer is MMU. So it's stored in memory management. So in the regular segmentation, where was uh, what in the base store? What what value was the base register storing? The the base address or the first address of that particular segment in NPM. Here with the segment recited, physical address. What will the base store when we do segmentation plus page table? So each each of the segment now has its own page table. So what do you think the base will now store? P 
PA for the page table for that segment. Everyone with me? So, so we started with a big, big page table. That big page table has a start address. It has a bound. So think of it. Think of the current of the starting paging uh, method as as we had in base and bounds. So we have a first base address corresponding to start of the base table, and then there's a bound. So the number of pages is the bound. Now we're doing the exact same thing as we do did for segmentation on the physical memory, but we're now doing it on the page table itself. So each of the segment now has to have a start base address for the page table, and it has to have a bound. The bounds would refer to here. Number of pages. So the number of valid pages or the end of the page table. Everyone with me at this point of time? So if not, this is a good time to stop and ask. Otherwise, uh, it will only get confusing from this point. Okay, so let me go back and again ask someone. Okay, so it, why why do we use the bounds register and what would be its value? Uh, bound is the number of valid in the, page table. In, in the page table for that particular segment. So it's a per segment page table. We have to have a starting address and base. We have to end, have an end address which corresponds to the bounds. So how does this reduce the uh, overhead, memory overhead? So let's say we started with 32 bit virtual address space. We have an offset of 12 bits, let's say. So we have a VPN corresponding to 20 bits. And let's say that now we have, so this is actually not trying to show the reference space, it's just showing the formula if you want to find out which segment uh, a particular address will be. So what we did is we said that there are three segments. How many bits do we need for that? Two bits. So as we did in the case of segmentation, it's fairly same. We use the top most significant bits. For, segment, uh, for finding out which segment this uh, address belongs to, the remaining uh, 12 to 14, 18 bits correspond to the virtual page number. Okay, so this is how uh, segmentation plus page tables would look like. So let's say that this was a core segment, it had only two valid pages. 10, 1, and something corresponding to 1. So this is not an entirely uh, correct mapping, but this is just for illustration. So we have a code page table, which has, which register? Which register, which two registers do we need? Base and bounds. The base is? Base is 0. Bounds is 2, because we have two virtual pages. Let's look at this segment, which is the heap, the base is 4, bound this to, because we have again two bases. For stack, what is the base, what is the bounds? Homework. Because stack grows in a reverse direction, it creates a lot of complications. And that's why, that's the, one of the reasons is that you require then again a direction bit also. That's why this approach is not so commonly used. In fact, this is not used. It's just to get a better understanding of where we could go. So what are the pros of this approach? So whenever you want to understand the pros and cons, you go back to this diagram. You see that the number of entries required here were 16. Here the number of entries required are uh, let's say 2, 2, and 2, maybe 2. 6 entries are required. <coughs> Plus, there are now 3 pairs of registers required. So that's an additional overhead, but it comes at the cost of reducing the number of entries. So are these uh, pages uh, linear or linked? Sorry, these pages are? These page tables? Yeah. The segmented ones, are they linked or? Uh... So currently they're linear. But, but that's an excellent point you've raised. Why do you want them to be linked test? Why do you think that would be good? Each page table length is smaller. Sorry, I didn't. Maybe I misunderstood. Misunderstood your question. 
No, I'm just asking what kind of uh, page table is it? So currently it's, it's the same page table as same data structure as we're using for the linear page table, but it's just a smaller chunk of it. So why is it bound to? I mean, I can only, there's only one page in the first fourth part, which is... Oh, I just, I just made this also valid. Okay. Just, just for some illustration. So maybe this is not 10, this is something else, and this is one. So, but why would we take links Because there yeah. is no uh, list. Yeah, just, just a minute. So, okay, maybe anyone else wants to answer. That's a con of this approach. So the answer we have already given that we can use a linked list, but why would we, why would we use a linked list? So because this will, the size of the segments will have to become fixed. So we don't keep the same size of the segments, but one of the cons is that, let's say we pick up this segment, which is the heap. Now there are gaps within heap itself. So that that is called internal <laughs> fragmentation. Now, what kind of situation would occur that we have gaps? I don't know, but there there can be some situation when there are there are a lot of gaps within a particular segment. So that was again a disadvantage of using segmentation that we still required a contiguous block of memory for the segment. So one of the ideas is can we use a linked list to now Let's say there are invalid pages is in a segment. Instead of having a big linear table here itself, we can again have a link list here. Everyone with, with me? No, sir. Yeah, okay. So let's first discuss the pros. So it leads to memory saving. Because the large gaps between segments, all that was being wasted earlier, but now it's not being wasted. In terms of cons, uh, uses segmentation, which then corresponds to its own set of cons. Uh, Pranjali, so what are the cons, uh, some of the cons of uh, segmentation? Segmentation in general, not in this particular example. Yeah. So it still has a sum of amount of data. Yeah, it still has contiguous block requirement and that leads to internal fragmentation in general. It assumes certain uses uh, patterns of address space as in code, heap and so on and so forth, their directions. And if there are sparsely used segments, sparsely used segments, I mean, so let's say that <laughs> this is a virtual address space. <coughs> This is our code segment. And this is our, let's say, heap. Now, if everything is being used, we might as just we might as well just use a simple linear table. So that, that's not a problem. But let's say that more than half of the entries in this heap, they are not present. So now all of this space would get wasted if we use a linear based table. Sort of. So the proposal again was that, so here itself instead of storing it, it, it a contiguous block, why not make it into a linked list? Now if you really are a fan of recursion, you, you say that, you know, maybe I don't like a linked list. I say that each of these is now itself a segment. So now you do segmentation on top of this. But that can still have holes. You do segmentation on, on top of that. So you can go on till infinity. So usage patterns as in, uh, you have a particular, so one, one of the pattern is that the stack grows in the opposite direction. The other is that you have these heap code and, and the stack, so they're in some particular order. So that's how segmentation uh, generally happens. You have you assign each of them in different spaces. But that is, but you might wonder that, why is that a con? Because then you can have any amount of segments, right? So, so, so using segmentation and separate, using a separate page table for each segment, that doesn't solve the problem? That doesn't solve which problem? So, so it's solved the problem in the sense that not completely solve the problem. Instead of 16 entries, now since the different segments are fairly sparsely populated, 
let's say that there are gaps between the segments. So you don't, okay, so I think your question is, if there are 16 entries, code has first two, the remaining 10 are with the heap, and the remaining are in the uh, stack. So if your question is, if we have to use all of these entries, then segmentation doesn't make sense. Is that the question? Okay, so, so let me propose one question. So I don't know whether this is the exact question you're asking or not. If there are 16 entries here, and we fixate the size of the code to be two, the remaining, the next 10 to be the D, so remaining the last four to be stacked, do we get any benefit by using segmentation then? No, right? Because then we're using the entire space. In fact, it's a loss of some additional registers and unnecessary overhead. So we get the benefit when these segments, so they're not actually occupying the physical, full, full physical space required. And they only require a subset of it. But then the shortcoming was, we can have a big enough segment or decently sized segment with gaps in it. So it still lead to, leads to some internal fragmentation. So that's how, that's another problem that we now need to solve. So, so this is in fact another problem. So, whenever we have variable size pages, it can lead to fragmentation. It can lead to external fragmentation also, because now you might not have that available space in the in the uh, physical. Memory. So, whenever we have segmentation, it leads to more problems than it solves. Usually. So, yeah. so, could you explain the point of external fragmentation? So now each of these segments, so previously what we were having was uniform tables, uniform page sizes. But now each of the segments says that, you know, I require, so this says that, you know, I require uh, four entries. Now the other one says that I require 16 entries. Other one says that I require 32 entries. So there is no uniformity now. So let's say that now you require 32 entries, but then there is again an amount of, uh, you have 28 entries at one point and you have four entries in some other dislocated or disjoint place, you still cannot allocate 32 points. 32. So, so is this like a separate point, point from the linked list? It's separate from the linked list, sorry. It should have been uh, a level of uh, indentation. Yeah. Already time. But we just look at one more minute just to get some idea. So. If we weren't able to solve the problem, previous problem using segmentation, we, yes, we then next use paging. So we use paging to solve the problem on the physical address space. Now we'll be using paging to solve the problem on the virtual address space. So we should end the class now. And for the next two, three minutes, I just want a few questions. I just want a few answers for the lab. So how many of us have used GDB before? Uh, less than half. How many of us have used Valgrind? Uh, DME 